Please be seated. Back in the uh, early 90s, my wife and I, we had the privilege of um, helping to plant a new congregation on the south shore of Clear Lake in South Shore Harbor. It's predominantly a boating and golfing community, so everybody owned a boat, so we had to get one. It was required uh, for us to purchase a boat. So we got a small boat, uh, a little 17-foot um, bow rider, and uh, we would take it out on Taylor Lake every once in a while, and kids learned to ski. It was nice. Uh, <clears throat> but my mother lived in Destin, Florida, and so one she lives on, on lived at that time on uh, Choctawatchee Bay, which is if you go down, if any of you ever go to any of the Panhandle of Florida, you probably cross on the Mid Bay Bridge, which comes over um, from Niceville to um, to Destin actually just east of Destin. And that bay that you go over is the Choctawatchee Bay. Well, she lived right on it. It was just a beautiful, had um, a gorgeous backyard that led out to the bay and a dock. And so we pulled the boat down there. The bay is very shallow. It's about three feet for the first half mile out. And uh, uh, so we really enjoyed the, just putting around out on the, on the bay. But one day we decided we would take the boat uh, our family would, and we would go down to Destin and eat lunch. So we got on the boat, it's about, um, I think maybe five miles, and it takes a little while to get there, so we buzzed on down, um, you know, wind in the hair, all that stuff that comes from boating. And when we got there though, there is, a, there is an inlet that comes from the ocean into Destin, into the uh, harbor, uh, Destin Harbor. And the yachts come in, in through there, and the currents come pouring through there really strong. And so all of a sudden, this little fiberglass 17-foot boat hits waves of four and five feet. And I, I mean, I was terrified. Uh, it just, and, you know, back and forth. And, the, I, and so my, my, they still laugh because they look to me like, are we okay? And I'm trying to look, we're fine. <laughs> but then I said, could you pass me my life jacket? I'd like to put my life jacket on, <laughs> which kind of gave it away that we weren't maybe so good. And uh, I don't know, it felt like we were there an hour trying to, but I was so afraid to turn the boat because if I turned it, I thought it would, the waves would knock it over. So I kept facing into the waves trying to stay afloat and we ultimately, we never got to lunch there. Uh, we <laughs> went home, but it was, uh, it, it was terrifying. What, what, I read this story and I, I couldn't help but think about just in that situation, the kind of terror I felt, the fear that just was overwhelming, that we're, we're gonna die kind of thing. My kids are gonna die, this whole sense of, of fear. And I, I was reading this passage thinking, where does Paul get this? Take courage, men. Where does he get that, that confidence, the courage that he can stand there and, and say, I, I, look, it's gonna be good, hang in there. That's, that's what I want to talk about today, and I think there are two, I think there are two things. So let's, let's begin with a prayer. Oh God, open us up. Open our eyes that we might see, our ears that we might hear. Open our hearts that we might feel. And then, oh Lord, open our hands that we might serve. Amen. So there's a story about uh, two tribes in the Andes Mountains. One was a lowlander's tribe, and one lived up in the mountains. And these tribes did not get along well, and one day went to war. And the, the, uh, the mountain tribe warriors came down and attacked the lowlanders uh, down in the lowlands and routed them. And when they were done, they kidnapped a baby from the lowlanders and took the baby up back into the mountains. Well, the lowlander tribe, um, the, those that were left, organized and said, we can't let that happen. One of our babies is up there, we have to go rescue it. And so they, um, 
They organized a, a party of their finest warriors and travelers to go up the mountain. But the problem was that the mountain tribe knew the mountains and they knew how to get up there and they were familiar with the mountains and they could climb the mountains and they knew how to do that. But the lowlanders knew nothing about mountains. They didn't know how to do it. And so they, they would try different trails, they would try different ways up, the, the cliffs were too steep, the trails uh, too difficult, they just didn't know what to do. And so after three days, they'd only made it 150 feet up the mountain, there was no way they were even gonna get up there. And so finally they just decided it was, it was time for them to stop. They, didn't, they were just beating their heads against the wall. And as they were packing their bags, they uh, noticed a woman coming down the trail from the mountain. And it was the mother of the kidnapped baby. And sure enough, she had that baby on her back. And they said to her, how did you do that? We have been trying for three days to get up this mountain. We have not made any distance and you've already rescued. How, how did you do that? We couldn't. And she said, it wasn't your baby. It's not your baby, it's my baby, and I'm going to do whatever it takes to rescue my baby. What I find so interesting about Paul, what I sometimes love, and I'm frankly, just to be in full transparency, what I find difficult about Paul sometimes is this whatever it takes mentality. I am gonna do what I'm told to do, whatever it takes. I, have, I am full steam ahead. A friend of mine, uh, we were talking about how we get fired up for Sunday mornings. How we, you know, it's the game time. How are we gonna get fired up for that? And he says he listens to a song by Imagine Dragons. Some of you know the Imagine Dragons. Uh, last week I made, a, I made a, um, a reference about uh, Festus in Gunsmoke and I realized that, you know, Anybody under uh, 60 had no idea who I was talking about. <laughs> Did some, so, well, a, a lot of you do, <laughs> but some of you didn't. And now I'm going to imagine dragons, which makes me much more current in my, uh, in, in my um, references. But he pointed me to this song, and once I listened to it, it's pretty cool. It, it, it's called Whatever It Takes. Whip, whip, run me like a racehorse, pull me like a ripcord, break me down, build me up. I want to be the slip, slip, word upon your lip, lip, letter that you rip, rip, break me down and build me up, whatever it takes. Because I want to be, because I love the adrenaline in my veins, I do whatever it takes. Because I love how it feels when I break the chains. I want to do this. I am all in, fully committed, totally going to do it. it um, when you read this uh, story, so here, l let me take us back through the story. For those of you who may not have been here last week, Paul has finished his third missionary journey. He was in Ephesus, and he left Ephesus knowing, he, was, he said, I'm going back to Jerusalem, and when I get to Jerusalem, I'm either going to be arrested or killed. And so he says goodbye to the elders of the church in Ephesus. He goes back to Jerusalem. Indeed, he is uh, he's arrested and he hears that he's going to be killed by the, by the religious authorities there. And as he's struggling with what to do, he, he says, he has this, what we heard from verse 20, from chapter 23. Um, we, we have this verse. The following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, take courage, you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you also must testify to me in Rome. Here's what you're gonna do, you're going to Rome. So what does he do? He, he, he indeed, he is um, taken from Jerusalem to Caesarea. There he stands before the Roman governors, he stands before the Jewish king Agrippa. He appeals to the emperor in Rome. And he is put on a ship, a prisoner ship, to be taken to Rome. It has cargo on it, it has prisoners on it. 276 people are aboard this ship. And uh, they stop at a place called Fair Havens, and while they're there, Paul says, you know, we probably ought not go. The weather's gonna be bad. And they, the captain says, no, I, I wanna get there before the fast, so he, puts out to sea and it wasn't a good decision. 
And this huge storm comes up. For two weeks, they're being buffeted. They throw all the food overboard. They throw all of the tackle overboard, trying to keep the ship afloat. Um, and they're terrified. And, and Paul then says these words to him. Last night, an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me and said, do not be afraid, Paul, for you must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for, it will, for I, I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. I, will, I know I am supposed to go to Rome and nothing is going to stop me, not even this shipwreck, not even, I mean, the, the ship runs aground on an island, he plays with uh, venomous snakes, he, I mean, he, Paul has all of these challenges and he's like, I'm going to Rome, no matter what, whatever it takes. When we have that kind of focus on the goal, the obstacles and challenges become simply things we got to get past. Some time ago, Angela Duckworth wrote a book called Grit, which really became a bestseller. Lots of people read it. It was about how do you, how do you persevere and get to something? And what she said was you have to have at least three levels of goals. And that was really helpful to me. You have to have an overriding life principle. This is the thing that, that I am focused on more than anything. This is what my life is all about. This is my overarching philosophy of life and what I think my purpose is. And then underneath that, you have goals that serve that purpose. You have smaller goals that are, are um, kind of uh, something that you want to be about for some period of your life. And then you have even smaller goals that serve those goals. And, but all of them have to hook to this overarching principle. Well, I notice that so much when I look at St. Paul. He has that. So he has this overarching principle. He says, the God whom I serve. This is about serving God. Ever since I was struck down on the road to Damascus, I'm about the business of serving God. And I'm going to do whatever it takes to serve God. And then... He, then he realizes that he has, a little, he has a more specific kind of mission. He says, I am to carry the gospel to the Gentiles. So I'm going to do whatever it takes because of my overarching life principle and my calling to take the gospel to the Gentiles. I'm going to do whatever it takes to get to the Gentiles. But then, well, how am I going to do that? Well, God has told me, by the way, I wish I had an angel tell me all the time. But God has told me that I am to, to testify in Rome. So you know what? If I'm going to carry the gospel to the Gentiles because of the God I serve, then I'm going to go to Rome no matter what. Let me, let me give you an example from my own life, how I try and keep my head together on this. It's like I have an overarching principle as I've identified my mission statement is I want to be a light. And wherever there's darkness, in whatever place I am, I want to be a light. A candle does what it does by being who it is. Um, I want to be a light wherever I go. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means in my family, I want to be a light. That's one of the, the goals that serves that overarching principle. I want to be a good husband. I want to be a good, uh, a good um, grandparent. I want to be a good parent. I want to be a good son. All of those things are a part of... of of what it means to, to live out that principle, right? And in my church, I, I, I want to be a part of a church that's a light to the community around it. That is, as we speak about in our vision, a, a city transformed by the love of Jesus. We want to, we're not here for ourselves. We're here for the community around us. I want to be a part of a church that's a light to the community. Well, if, if that's what we're going to be about, then what are the goals underneath it? Well, you know what? We need to build a... a, a, a a community youth center on our Gethsemane campus to make a difference in that neighborhood. And, and that is so that we can be a church that's all about the business of, of, uh, of, of a city transformed by the love of Jesus. And that's all driven by me personally for about being just being a light. It's, these, it's this overarching sort of, this is what matters. And whatever it takes, I want to accomplish these goals. That's what, that's what seems to be driving him forward, pushing him on. 
Sid Davis gave me a book a long time ago called The War of Art, which talks about resistance. And any time you want to do something, you're going to have to push through the resistance. The resistance might be, if you want to write a book, the resistance might be a voice telling you, your book's going to stink. Um, if the resistance might be, wouldn't it be better to rearrange your closet first and then you can write the book? Those are all these things that come at you. And if you've got, if you want to get that book written, you're going to have to have a mindset that says, you know what, whatever it takes, I'm going to write that book. By golly. Right? Unless you're totally committed, you need to just let it go. So what drives Paul forward to push past those things? He, even he says in, even when he gets to Rome, he's imprisoned in Rome. And in his, in his prison letters, he writes this. He has this clarity of, of purpose. He says, brothers and sisters, I do not consider that I have laid hold of it, but one thing I have laid hold of, forgetting what lies behind, straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the, toward the goal of the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Yeah, I haven't got there yet. I'm in prison here, but man, I'm not giving up. So here's the thing. If I'm going to really look at my life and say, all right, these are my goals and all that stuff, how much of the time do I have that whatever it takes mentality? Maybe 30%. I wish I was like St. Paul. I wish I was just you know, whatever it takes, get out of my way. But it, I'm not. And you may not have that kind of clarity and passion of purpose either. Oh, I wish, I wish we did, and I think we should. But that is not the overarching message of this passage. And it's not the overarching, as, as important as it is for providing a way to push through the obstacles and difficulties we face, it's not the, the, the real issue. And it's certainly not the real message of the gospel. The real message of the gospel is that we have a God who is whatever it takes for us. I want you to hear again the, the passage that was read, and, and I want to start with one verse a little earlier uh, first. <clears throat> he says, when neither sun, the verse 20 says, when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up hope, all hope of being saved. And then Paul speaks to them and says, last night an angel of the God to whom I belong and who I serve. Stood beside me and said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously, God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. And keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as, as I was told. You see, the picture is of, that it, it isn't about the gospel isn't about what we've done, our strength of character, our strength of courage, facing all the trials. The gospel is about what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. And, and God's love for us, that we belong to God, that we are God's beloved, and that, that God will do whatever it takes for us. Look, when the scripture says, I've, I've prayed so hard this week about trying to find words to communicate to you where, where we can find that sense of peace in the midst of fear, because the storms of life are there. We have, you may have storms in your family, you have relational storms, you have financial storms, you have health storms, you have storms in, in your community, there's storms all around us that we're facing all the time, and, and fear is real. I live with it every day, and so do you. It, it, why do you think the Bible says like a thousand times, do not be afraid, do not be afraid, do not be afraid, because we're a people who are afraid. But somehow, in the midst of that fear, at the same time of that fear, down at the, at the base of my soul, 
It's at a pre-rational, pre-emotional level, below my emotions, below my understanding about the doctrine of the atonement. Down below all of that is a belief that I belong to God and that I am loved. I am, I am deeply loved. This fall, we're going to talk about children and families and and our responsibility to each other as church family. And part of it is to take these children at that point when they're so malleable and just help them know for sure that no matter what comes their way, they are deeply loved by God. Because at the core of their soul, when fear is raising its head, they need to be able to reach down and take hold of that place to say, I belong to God. And I'm, I'm going to trust that and hold fast to that. Eugene Peterson, um, great theologian, Presbyterian pastor, wrote, uh, the, when, if you ever read the message version of the Bible, he translated that. Um, but he wrote a book called A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. And I want to read to you what he said because it just, it, it, I, I found it. The central reality for Christians is the personal, unalterable, persevering commitment God makes to us. Perseverance is not the result of our determination. It is the result of God's faithfulness. We survive in the way of faith not because we have extraordinary stamina, but because God is righteous, because God sticks with us. Christian discipleship is a process of paying more and more attention to God's righteousness and less and less attention to our own, finding the meaning in our lives not by probing our own moods and motives and morals, but by believing in God's will and purposes, making a map of the faithfulness of God, not charting the rise and fall of our enthusiasms. It is out of such a reality that we acquire perseverance. I look at my own uh, faith journey, how I feel about faith, about mission, about, um, about discipleship, and it, it looks like a roller coaster. But, but, but that's irrelevant in God's mind, in that God's love for me does not waver one bit, depending. And the more I can focus myself, rather than take my own temperature, the more I can focus myself on what God has done for me, the more my sense of trust in God is rooted. And that's a, that's a hard thing to do. But isn't that the whole message of the gospel? That God would do whatever it takes, like even send his son to die for us? That whatever it takes, God is gonna, gonna do it for us. That God tried over and over to get us to live the right kind of life and to jump to, to be righteous and to show us what it means to be righteous, but we couldn't do it and he wouldn't give up on us and said, I'm gonna do whatever it takes to claim you for my own because you belong to me. God is like that mother coming down the mountain with you and me on her back. It's my baby. So I'm going to do whatever it takes. And that helps me to know that even, even if I die, even if the worst thing happens to me, that death won't separate me from God's love, that God's got me right in the palm of his hand. And whatever I go through, nothing can take that away. Let's pray together. Gracious and loving God, we know that you call us to live a life of purpose, that we are called to, to live with that purpose and that mission to be whatever it takes people for what you call us to, to do and to be, to be your disciples. We want to be the, that kind of, of person. And yet, God, we know that we fall so short and it doesn't change your love for us. That you are that God that will do whatever it takes for us. That you will stand by us in every situation. And so we trust in you. For you are a God whose character is always to save. 
We pray in the name of Christ. Amen. So our closing hymn is number 512, When the Storms of Life Are Raging, Stand By Me. Let's stand and sing all the verses.